Hey, hey, everybody, are you there? Can you hear and see this? I hope so, because a lot of work went into making this happen. If you are watching, it means my treatment for the subject of this video turned out in our favor and we beat this system again. I'm not sure if there's going to be repercussions for it later, but we got lucky last time, and hopefully, we'll get lucky twice. I'll be honest, I never expected a trip into the SCP Foundation to be as much of a hit as our first adventure last year was. You guys enjoyed learning about the monsters among us even more than I enjoyed getting the information. After a turnout like that, I felt twice as motivated to get more entries from the vaults of the Foundation to celebrate October. Unfortunately, breaking into a top secret facility is the kind of trick you only pull off once without being captured and thrown in containment yourself. So there's no going back the way we came in last time. Over the past year, I've had to research ways of getting a new list together, and it's been a weird and dangerous adventure on its own. But after a bit of digging, I struck gold, and in a really unexpected way. The difficulty of being the secure, contained, protect foundation in today's world comes mainly in the contained portion of the mission statement. Since the advent of widespread media, and of course, the internet, keeping secrets has become insanely hard. Bad for them, good for us. Depending on what we're after, anyhow. The Foundation has a lot of enemies and plenty of rogue agents, leakers, and employees who have just let information slip to the public, and you can leave it to society to take advantage of their unhappy accidents. Many Foundation secrets have been collected and hidden in plain view, disguised as more innocent things, planted by those who want the world to know the full extent of reality. Thanks to the work of a friend in the field, I'm now the owner of one such collection. A VHS tape from 1996 that has a very limited amount of copies. The Foundation actually knows about the company responsible for making these, and some of the tapes they've made are catalogued in their web-crawling security. I have no idea if the VHS I've come across is part of the archive, but we'll find out by measure of whether or not this video goes down. As a precaution, I'm playing this in a room far removed from where I am on a VCR setup with remote controls for all the normal functions. It was pretty tedious to set it all up for a live recording onto my desktop from quite a distance, but I did pull it off. I've also made the video run through a system that changes up the audio and converts the original video format to the new standard, 16x9, so we won't be seeing things in a big square as if this was really 1996. This approach serves a dual purpose. First, it messes with the image on the tape enough that the foundation web crawler shouldn't be able to catch it. The audio, likewise, shouldn't be too easily detected. Second, I've heard rumors about these tapes. It's just pure speculation, but some believe the Foundation has been rounding them up because the tapes themselves are containment-worthy anomalies that pose a danger to viewers, and not just because they're hiding Foundation secrets. If that's the case, we might see something happen while viewing, and be far enough away from whatever danger it poses. I think. A bit of background for you on this tape. The company that made it was a legitimate independent studio that operated from 1992 to 1996. I say legitimate in the sense that they were actually trying to be a company who made products, not in the sense that they were actually a good business. You know all the no-name studios and production companies making cheap cash grab movies to put straight on DVD for children? Groups like that have always been around, and this was one of them. Dilly's home video specialized in peddling sci-fi, horror, and weird subject videos for as cheaply and quickly as they could. Total mass marketing shot in the director's backyard garbage and schlock from the 90s. That's essentially what we've got here. Pleasant viewing, right? Don't worry, the value lies in what one of the employees at Dilly pulled off, hiding SCP Foundation secrets in the middle of the video bargain bin at retail chains across the United States. He convinced the producer to create a series called Dilly's You'll Never Believe It, a rip-off of the much more famous Ripley's Believe It or Not. The producer at Dilly's thought it was just a smart move, conning people into eating up urban legends and weird tales, drawing on their morbid curiosity and appetite for the odd and outrageous, but the employee who was trying to smuggle SCP secrets as part of an enemy group to the Foundation knew it was the best way to get the word out on a potentially devastating scale. Remember, this was 1996. The internet was just a baby at this time. Home video was massive. Now here we are today, with one of the only surviving copies of a Dilly's You'll Never Believe It tape. It apparently features eight crazy urban legends that you might encounter today, and while viewers would never believe it, they would have been right to. Everything in here is an SCP Foundation entry. My research let me know that there have been quite a few embellishments and changes to the source material in Dilly's tape, but that's to be expected. The employee actually writing for the videos would never want to be too specific, or the Foundation would catch wind immediately. I've got details with me here on the entries to separate fact from fiction, so we'll make the proper stops along the way to clear the air and get the real story. With that settled, let's get into it and hope the webcrawler hasn't added this video to its archive yet. Dilly's You'll Never Believe It, 
1990s straight-to-video D-list production studio garbage at its finest. Here we go. Have you ever walked home alone at night in your neighborhood, feeling your spine tingle with the sense of being watched? Have you ever entered an old antique store and placed your hand on an item that filled you with dread? Have you ever sat at a campfire and listened to stories of ghosts and goblins that played in the woods while you slept? Take all those feelings, all those fears, mix them together, embrace yourself. You're about to experience a powerful cocktail of shock, intrigue, and horror. Legends, stories, and tales to keep you up tonight, if you can believe them. Dilly's Home Video is proud to present, you'll never believe it, True Urban Legends of America. Autumn is a wonderful time of the year in the United States. The leaves are turning, the air is growing just a bit colder, the night falls sooner, and everywhere you look, there are big, beautiful pumpkins to be found. But those among us with less than mighty immune systems know, there is always the burden of seasonal illness that comes with every glass of hot apple cider. For one sleepy New England town, the annual autumn cold is the least of all worries. Chester, Massachusetts is a place just 45 minutes outside of Springfield. Home to just under 1,300 residents, it's by no means a very big place, but it's just big enough for those living on its woods to catch sight of some fearsome visitor. Since the early 1950s, locals say there have been visits by a doctor, a doctor of death. Some call it a man, others call it a creature, but all agree on its appearance. A cloaked, hooded figure wearing the mask of a plague doctor, stalking the woods outside of a quiet little home. Some stories vary in their descriptions, but a pattern has come to emerge among them about the sightings of this mysterious visitor. He appears once, signaling the start of a light illness in the home, such as a headache or a cold, usually coming across as seasonal allergies. After five to seven days, if the illness has persisted and grown into symptoms, he appears again, and the sufferer will become bedridden. Two days later, if the sufferer has not been taken to the hospital, the doctor will make a very late and a very intrusive house call, and those who stand in his way become immediately ill as the first sick member of the household. During this third visit, the house call, the hooded doctor will isolate themselves in the room of the infirm. It is unknown what goes on in the room at this time. All doors and windows become locked and impossible to see through. Once the door opens, the doctor is gone, and the ill member of the home lies dead showing all the symptoms of the infamous bubonic plague. Okay, so, for some of you who are SCP Foundation buffs and have done some snooping of your own, you're already familiar with this one. SCP-049, The Plague Doctor As popular as he is today, The Plague Doctor was a relatively unknown sort of menace during the 90s to everybody except the Foundation, and this creature is a lot more dangerous than a visual representation for sickness entering the home. SCP-049 is reported as having a touch that's incredibly lethal to humans. It begins activity patterns by choosing a human target, which is referred to as SCP-04902. After the plague doctor places his hand on a victim, they'll begin to suffer a severe reaction, the details of which have been censored from the record, and instead of becoming bedridden, the victim dies in moments. SCP-049 then proceeds to kill all humans it can find nearby in the same way. It never just stops by visiting one sick person. Once the area is filled with corpses, the plague doctor returns to victim number one and takes a bag filled with scalpels, needles, thread, and vials of unidentified liquids from under its cloak. 049 will begin dissecting their first victim and injecting various chemicals into the body. After approximately 20 minutes, the plague doctor sews SCP-0492 back up and simply waits. After a few minutes, victim one will resume vital signs and seemingly come back to life, but without any higher brain function. Like a zombie, they'll wander aimlessly until coming across another living human, and then begin attacking mercilessly. Reports indicate that SCP-0492's adrenaline and endorphin levels increase to approximately 300% at this time, and it will kill as many people as possible before coming down from its adrenaline spike. Then, until contained by Foundation personnel, it will continue to wander, looking for more victims. Only one interview has ever been conducted with SCP-049, the sum of which comes down to it expressing that the plague doctor is looking to cure the pestilence. It's not said what exactly that pestilence is or what the cure really involves. The Foundation is still conducting research. Let's move on to our next urban legend and see how much Dilly is left intact. Here's hoping our first stop in Haunted America didn't make you too sick. We have much more to see. Follow us now as we head west, just to the edge of New York State, into a village called Forestville. A very quiet farming community, 
Forestville's population is small enough for a word to get around whenever something odd happens. And for years, there's been talk of a local legend that, while placed in other towns and villages to some, started right here. As a quiet, work-minded place, Forestville doesn't have quite as much activity to keep its children busy. Because of this, many of them have taken on the role of explorer. Its reputation for getting the youth outside to play and experience the hidden world is the catalyst for our second urban legend, a tale far more unbelievable than what lies in Chester, Massachusetts. It's been said that in the local park, there's a trail leading into the woods going over a small hill. Short drain tunnels have been built into its base, helping even out the flooding of any heavy rains that pass through. On any day, the tunnels are clear, and children occupy themselves running through them. But years ago, the locals say, there was a child who decided to visit the tunnels past the time he should have been home for dinner. With the sun almost fully set behind him, the boy approached the hill, climbed down, and prepared to enter the tunnel so he could run through to the other side. But, crouched in the middle, its back turned to him, there sat a monster. A monster, unlike anything he had ever seen. As small as the village population was, it didn't prevent locals from dropping trash nearby. It seems the park had taken its trash and remade it into something new. Something evil. A man-shaped creature made out of garbage lurked in the tunnel. And as soon as it spotted the boy, it reached out with arms made of cardboard, taped in plastic. He crawled out of the end and ran as fast as he could, the monster trailing behind him. A nightmare of trash and Mother Nature's anger. I like the angle they took for this story, I really do, because it's a lot better than the reality. Mostly because the tunnel monster, SCP-3663, is actually very sad to talk about. According to the Foundation records, 3663 is a humanoid entity constructed primarily from cardboard, adhesive tape, and twine. It's fully capable of movement and making sound, and is capable of some communication, responding to questions and reacting to its immediate environment. Underneath the boxes and tubes, researchers have found cardboard and paper models resembling all major human organs, with colored wool representing blood vessels and the nervous system. 3663 doesn't need these organs to function, which is even more interesting. It can transport itself and other objects over long distances, with no limit to the range discovered yet. Though it can go anywhere, 3663 prefers small, confined, tunnel-like spaces, or network of spaces that resemble tunnels. It has a very predictable pattern of behavior, which repeats after completion of a cycle. SCP-3663 will manifest in a tunnel-like area or system of enclosed spaces, waving its arm and making noises, attempting to look frightening. It wanders the area for a while, just trying to appear as if it's a monster until coming across a person. The tunnel monster will then grab the person in question, resulting in immediate senses of paranoia and fear, and they'll both teleport to a new location that seems like a tunnel or a maze. The person will be unconscious or very much out of it, but otherwise alright. SCP-3663 then teleports again on its own, appearing in yet another area resembling a tunnel or system of tunnels to repeat the cycle. Attacks on 3663 have resulted in immediate teleportation, which seems to repair the creature if it takes any damage. An interview conducted with SCP-3663 reveals a very odd personality type for the entity. It responds to all questions with a form of statement or assertion that it's not an SCP, it's the Tunnel Monster. The Tunnel Monster captures people. That's me. I'm the Tunnel Monster. I... I capture people and take them into the tunnels where I live. In the tunnels. The pipes. I'm the Tunnel Monster. The Tunnel Monster keeps responding in this way, sounding unsure of its own identity, or struggling to keep hold of its own intentions. Things get really interesting here when it says, I don't want to do this. It's what I do. I have to do it. I'm the Tunnel Monster. Two wet patches are observed forming on SCP-3663's face. Please. I don't want to play anymore. I'm the monster. Shortly after this interview comes a report of Event 3663 Delta, detailing a containment breach. The tunnel monster emerged from the Site-54 maintenance tunnels and began to emit vocalizations in excess of 80 decibels. These vocalizations, described as pained by on-site staff, had a profound psychological effect, placing many personnel into a state of shock. For roughly four hours, SCP-3663 wandered the facility, attacking staff and engaging in small-scale vandalism of facilities. Of note is the fact that SCP-3663 repeatedly attempted self-harm by means of knives, pipes, water taps, and firearms. While SCP-3663 was repeatedly destroyed in the process, it subsequently remanifested in the nearest air duct or maintenance area. After the event, two bodies of former personnel were found in Site-54. Autopsy showed the cause of death was buildup of paper residue in all major blood vessels, as well as sinuses, ear tubes, and digestive and respiratory systems. 
A number of other staff members were found to have been affected to a lesser degree, but are expected to make full recoveries. An addendum to the article makes everything about the tunnel monster much clearer. The Foundation apparently discovered a very old security camera tape that shows two young boys between the ages of 8 and 12 playing in a construction yard. The first, designated 3663-1, is running from the other, who is wearing a cardboard suit that looks precisely like the tunnel monster. It becomes clear they're playing a game in which the boy in the costume chases the other through sections of an unfinished water drain system. They're running through small tunnel pieces. During a moment of the sky darkening, the boys appear to stop playing and try removing the suit, only to realize that it's stuck. The camera turns to static, and when visuals resume, only the boy in the tunnel monster suit can be seen, wandering around, rapping at the costume head before suddenly teleporting out of sight. The other boy was reportedly found unconscious in a subway line many miles away, with no memory of their friend at all. They claim to have been playing alone. Foundation research revealed that just before the containment breach resulting from the severe upset of the tunnel monster, the boy from the video who had been playing with him, the last friend he ever had, died at the old age of 79. Efforts are still ongoing to figure out how the boy in the tunnel monster costume actually ended up becoming the tunnel monster permanently. This is one of those cases from the archives that seems entirely silly until you begin to really read into it. Then, it just becomes sad. Let's see how our next entry turns out. I'm thinking it will be much less sad, but just as weird. Speaking of children, our next entry ought to make the parents in our audience think twice about being lax in their religious raising, and make our younger viewers remember their devotion a good bit more, if you can believe it. Not quite taking place in any specific location, this tale concerns all those adopted by a belief system that mentions the ultimate adversary of humanity, the devil, Satan, Beelzebub, the dragon, the king of all lies, all of these names and yet only one way to accidentally summon him. When children are tucked in at night, there is an expectation that if they have been recognized by a path of faith, they will pray before falling asleep, asking for protection and love and giving thanks to their higher power. Most children raised in this manner follow through, and some adults among us who didn't always take this precaution in their youth have come to light recently to express that there were indeed consequences for ignoring the lessons taught. In the middle of the night, some children who neglected their prayers recalled the lights in their room suddenly coming on without being touched, shining a bright, burning red. Just as suddenly as this occurred, they would hear the front door of their house open, and those who were within sight of it noted a tall, dark, hooded figure entering their home. Running to bed, the children would soon see they wouldn't be escaping the sudden intruder. He would glide in through the bedroom door, and without a word, approach the seat closest to their bed. The figure would sit down, produce a book from inside their cloak, and then take off their hood, revealing a dark, red face and two horns growing from its head. With clawed hands, it would open his book, for surely it was he, as they could now see the devil himself had entered their bedroom, and he would begin reading from inside. Fairy tales from hell, quite literally, would be told to the children. Morality lessons, much like the ones told in Sunday school, would be shared but now including vivid descriptions of the evils and torture brought down on all naughty children who disobeyed their parents, their teachers, their priests, and their god. Crying, sobbing, and hiding from the storytelling devil of any sort would get a serious wag of the finger and a shaking of the head, and the visiting devil would relish the act of describing every punishment inflicted on children in his bedtime stories. Survivors of this encounter all say he read different stories to them, but they were all equally horrifying. Vivid tales of suffering on emotional, mental, and especially physical scales. And no matter who he visited, he would always read the same amount of stories. Six. Then, he would rise, slowly leave the room, making sure the child was fully traumatized along the way, and then exit his work done. Yeah, that's pretty traumatizing I'd say with the way they sold that one. But actually, the truth is that children who forget their prayers aren't the most likely victims of this at all. Coming across SCP-2980 doesn't involve prayer. Instead, this event stems from turning on a nightlight with a red mounting bracket that has a smiley face drawn on both sides. Apparently, this object works whether electricity is flowing or not, as long as you flip the switch through the on position and plug it into an outlet. At 8.30pm in any time zone, the light will suddenly come on, glowing bright red and all other lights in the room will dim until only the nightlight is glowing. That is when literally Satan will appear, materializing inside the room with a small black book containing leather binding and parchment pages. He'll put on a pair of glasses and, for 15 to 20 minutes, read a story or a short collection of stories to anybody in the room. 
If the listener falls asleep during the story, he'll simply disappear. If they listen to the full story, they'll still fall asleep and then wake up nine hours later, reporting that they feel incredibly well rested. Examination of the stories told reveals that they're not morality lessons to scare human children at all, but instead the kind of nursery rhymes you would tell a demon child born and raised in hell. Here's the little demon space cadet, about a small demon who makes a spaceship out of human bones to fly to the moon. Sleepy time with Grog the Unspeakable, a tale about a creature who is trying to find a good place to settle down for his millennium-long hibernation. Bedtime for Baby Beelzebub, a story about Satan being laid down to sleep with the help of a blanket made of damned human souls and the screams of the tortured. Danby, the legend of a young deer who signs a deal with a demon to go on a blood-soaked journey of revenge against humanity after his mother is shot by a hunter, and a story about a creature in the Foundation's care that Satan claims is actually just a work of fiction. They're still trying to figure that one out. An interview was conducted with SCP-2980-1, the being who came from the nightlight, aka literally the devil, who says, I think I just got tired of doing the same old thing all the time, you know? I mean, everybody sort of gets in their head that it's some easy thing to torture and damn people for an eternity, but it really starts to wear on you after a while. Besides, for the last thousand years or so, I'd really been wanting to take my writing on the road, right? Get out there and see my people. So a few months ago, I loaded up my things, and well, here I am. It's revealed in the interview that the nightlight which summons him was discovered in an orphanage, and Satan says he put it there to do a bit of charity work, helping the less fortunate children sleep at night. I really don't know what else to say about this one. I guess it's just kind of cool that it works, right? Nine hours of sleep guaranteed with a well-rested feeling. Let's keep going with our video. A bit less on the religious side and quite a lot more on the unbelievable side, our next tale comes from the city of Wichita Falls in Texas. Imagine, if you will, your daily afternoon television, your favorite shows, the way they usually present themselves, the cast of characters and the situations. Imagine a sitcom just like them, but broadcast deep into the night when the world is asleep and there is nothing on the air aside from commercials and filler. Imagine a sitcom airing at this time, unannounced, in the middle of an advertisement, and focus entirely on talking dogs. This is an odd event that citizens in Wichita Falls have been experiencing since the early 1980s. Never on a strict schedule, never at a strict time, but always between the hours of 2 and 4 a.m. The Dog House is a show that viewers say is played out by actual animal people talking and acting like human beings. Those who view the program say it presents itself like any other show, even including name and role credits at the beginning, though a full cast and crew is never revealed at the end. Attempts to record the program with the VCR have been made, but all result in pure static. Even in video recordings of the television playing the show result in static. Thankfully, Dilly's home video was able to provide us with this kind of accurate visual representation. Kind of. So, here's what they got wrong or didn't include. The show doesn't air at all anymore, and we'll get to the reason why, but when it did come on the air, it happened every Tuesday at 11.30pm and ran for 20 minutes. The show did include actual dog-human hybrids, real, living animal people standing up and wearing clothing, acting like any kind of normal person, but it also included a college-age man as the central character. The entire show was set up like a form of sitcom taking place in Los Angeles, and there were anywhere between four and eight dogmen at any time. Episodes came out in the sitcom set up right up to about episode 14, when it was reported that a breakdown in visuals began, and many lines of dialogue were unrelated to the plot of the show. There's one exchange noted by the Foundation as being significant. An unnamed canine says, Please don't let it break, to which the college-age man replies, I won't. It's too important to break. It's been so nice being able to think, the canine says. I know. I won't let it break. I'll fix it somehow, I promise. I suppose I should just enjoy the moment before I have to go back. At least it gave me these moments. I'll always have that. The following episode had no title sequence and simply contained 19 minutes and 32 seconds of footage showing two malnourished dogs lying in a cage. They barely moved for the duration of the video and the camera did not change position either. The following week, no episode aired. The Foundation made a note of its absence for the two weeks following that as well, and then they made a breakthrough. In Canada, a rented space was investigated by its landlord following the failure of the man renting it to make a payment. Discovery of what was left inside prompted calls to police, which alerted the Foundation. A cleanup and research crew arrived to find four large dog crates and seven corpses, one college-age man and six dogs of different breeds. Recording and broadcasting equipment was found, much of it broken, including a VHS player labeled Outgoing Episodes. 
One surviving dog was found, a male Weimaraner displaying signs of severe deformity and malnutrition. The dog passed away within one hour of being removed from the location. Autopsy revealed that portions of its skeleton had been replaced with human bones, mainly in the spot of the jaw, skull, and legs. This is another one of the entries in the Foundation's archives that starts out pretty silly, but ends up as the complete opposite of the tunnel monster. Much more disturbing than sad. Let's see what else we've got on this tape. While the group of dogmen in Texas are confined to their TV, you may wish to be careful about your choice of lifestyle, as you may bring out our next unbelievable legend right to you. Once again, this item is not confined to any one area. It can happen to anyone who fits the description at any time. We all know about certain people in life who close themselves off to others. The hermits, the unsociable, the lazy and uninspired. Young men who aren't in school, working, or seeking to better themselves, choosing a life of wasting away. We've all thought about saying something to these people, just a helpful word, to push them on their way to getting out a bit more or pursuing a higher purpose. But succeeding in changing someone like this is no easy feat, and is best left to professionals. If you think the treatment is something they deserve, Known as the Lonely Strangers, these specters appear to society's willing hermits in the shape of dark, humanoid creatures wearing white masks. They approach slowly, not stopping in their pursuit until successfully making physical contact with a target. The person is wrapped up in their cloak for a moment, according to those who have been visited, and then find themselves alone, wearing the outfit of the specter. All traces of the ghostly visitors will have disappeared except for the cloak and white mask. From this point, it seems the story lines up pretty well with what's actually detailed in the Foundation archives. It's surprising how on the mark the producer was in seeing this one come through without many changes to the real account. For the sake of brevity, we'll call this group the Lonely Strangers, and they do indeed go after lonely people who are isolated by choice or self-generated circumstances. The needs of society, specifically. Those who are not in education, employment, or training are very likely to be targeted, and even though a visit from the Lonely Strangers can turn them around, it's the worst possible medicine for their situation. First, let's tackle the idea that anybody visited is embraced and left wearing the clothing of a lonely stranger. This is definitely false. According to the article for SCP-414, all these creatures have to do is touch you or have a face-to-face -face conversation and their effect is going to take place. Anyone who contracts the illness of SCP-414 will have a very rapid and sudden change of heart, reporting that their lifestyle of isolation and self-preoccupation has finally become exhaustingly lonely. They can't deal with living this way anymore, as it's not even living, and they begin to seek out other people, stating that solitary activities no longer give them pleasure. They'll start trying to experience prolonged moments of activity with others at least once every week, and it's reported they begin losing memory of times in life that help shape their personal identity. Their overall sense of self starts to severely decline and the need for other people increases, making them seek out major periods of contact every four to five days. They also begin looking for major social events, finding a need to engage in them once a week. Over time, the person will grow such a dependence on interaction with other people that any time spent alone will result in episodes of depression, which worsen as the disease increases in potency. Only social contact helps cure this illness, and any excuse to be part of something or be around people every two days is taken. Victims report that they can't remember ever having significant relationships that last longer than two years, and their sense of self becomes their name, gender, age, and current mood. They appear to feed their emptiness by engaging in as much activity as they can, including community service, odd jobs, sudden moments of being helpful, and even hosting events, a very sharp contrast to who they once were. During the final stage of the illness, victims report hallucinations and actual physical sensations of being hollow when they're not being social with people. They'll actually become upset when not in proximity to another person for any length of time over 15 minutes. They can't recall ever having significant relationships of any kind. There are no survivors of this condition. The longer a victim lives, the closer they come to committing suicide, unable to satiate the need instilled in them by the lonely strangers. Nearly half die at their own hand around the five-year infection mark, with a range closer to three-fourths by ten years. Those over the age of 40 at the time of infection have nearly doubled the risk of suicide during the same time spans of infection duration. An interview with the strangers by an SCP researcher who was unfortunate enough to contract the disease reveals their intention. The doctor asks, why are you doing this? How do you benefit by doing this to people? The group of strangers then speak as one, replying as if they were a single being. They work so little. They are held up when they need to be the foundation. The young much so. I will help every one of you. Even when they kill themselves, the doctor asks? Even when they forget who they are? How does that help? What is your reasoning? It is a last usefulness to society to die and leave resources for others. Others make use of them. Forget yourself for your society. 
You cannot be egotistical when the ego is carved out. Selfishness. I will cure it by excising the tumor. I cure society and make the lost find purpose. I help. The story of Dr. Chang, who was told goodbye with a kiss by the lead stranger, goes exactly as expected from the description of the disease. It's most likely the reason the Foundation has such detailed info about how it works and what happens at each point of infection. It's a pretty sad and very morbid story, I'll admit. Perhaps our next entry will be lighter. Those who are already outgoing people may find themselves turning down their own friendly nature with our next tour stop. It's well established by now that picking up strangers isn't the best idea. Too many stories of the good-natured hitchhikers turning out to be less than genuine. But in this tale, you'll find plenty of reason to avoid being too kind on the street, if you can believe it. In the town of Chesterfield, Indiana, there's a story about a young woman walking home alone at night along the road. She's been said to have long, flowing hair that is almost white and wears a red sweater. Those who have seen her claim a very strong urge to stop and ask if she needs help. Any driver who stops for the woman receives a gentle nod of the head, and the woman enters the back seat. Quiet, polite answers are provided to any questions asked, and the girl states that she's heading home, just two minutes or so down the road from where she was found. The girl will instruct the driver to stop at an opening in the trees alongside the road, appearing as if it were a long driveway. She will thank the driver, exit, and walk into the dark. It's at this point that a driver may notice she's missing her red sweater, or they'll see it themselves in the back seat first. A call will be made to the girl that she's forgotten it, and after a moment of silence, she returns at the driver's side window. Thank you, the girl says, then pulls her hair away from her face, smiling and revealing that her eyes had been torn out of her head, leaving empty, bleeding holes, laughing as the driver speeds away. Curiosity has gotten the better of few drivers who know the story or picked up the girl themselves. During the day, they've gone to the spot where the girl claimed her home was, and ventured down the path between the trees. Always waiting for them at the end of the driveway was not a house, but a graveyard. The true home to a girl who was nothing more than a very frightening ghost. Okay, never mind what I said about hoping for a nicer entry because this one is not so fun. SCP-1337, The Hitchhiker, is way closer to Halloween storytelling material than most of what we've come across so far. Let's clear the fact from fiction right away. There is a hitchhiking ghost girl, yes. She does wear a red sweater, she'll pretend to be dropped off at her house, walk into the darkness and leave the sweater behind. That is true. Her name was Mary Talish, who was abducted, ritually tortured, and executed as part of occult practices on May 19th, 1952, in the town of Muncie, Indiana, which is near Chesterfield, but not actually in it. She began appearing as a ghost 19 months after her death on the 19th of each and every month, so it's not possible to encounter her at a random time. She would flag down passing vehicles and tell anybody who picked her up that she was lost and needed to go home. Mary would then give directions to the driver that led them directly past the graveyard where she was buried, then encourage the driver to stop there. Mary would leave the car and vanish, nothing about disappearing into the trees. Her sweater would remain behind, and anybody who touched it would feel an immediate need to return it to her home, where her parents lived. According to the article, Mary appeared as a completely normal, healthy woman during the years following her death when picked up as a ghost. It was in 1973 that things took a very bad turn. The Foundation had enlisted the parents of Mary Talish in their efforts to lay their daughter to rest, who, as you can imagine, were a little bit overwhelmed by strangers showing up to their door to give their murdered daughter her sweater time and time again. One of the researchers took it upon himself to prove to the Foundation that he could decommission the case without figuring out the details of the ritual torture and murder that made Mary Talish a ghost. His logic was that if Mary had no home to return to and no one to accept her sweater, she would stop appearing. The researcher went behind the Foundation's back and signed off on a kill order, executing Mary Talish's parents and demolishing the house. Three years later, SCP-1337 was considered decommissioned. Mary had stopped coming back. As horrible as his methods had been, the doctor appeared to have been correct. It was in 1983 when he returned to the site on a whim to ensure that there were absolutely no remnants of the hitchhiking girl. According to the article, his last transmission consisted of only the words, Wait, who the hell are you? When security arrived on the scene, the doctor was found deceased, his body mutilated in the same manner as Mary Talish's had been when she was found. Since that time, on the 19th of every month, SCP-1337 has returned, with a different method of operation. Recordings have shown that its physical appearance has changed. SCP-1337 still manifests with the same basic physical appearance, but now shows the wounds of its death. The eyes appear to have been gouged from their sockets, and its clothing is ripped and stained mid-chest to reveal the empty cavity where its heart was removed. SCP-1337's range of movement has extended to all of the back roads of Muncie. 
If a vehicle stops for SCP-1337, it vanishes from view to reappear on another road. Should a vehicle pass 1337 by, it will then appear inside the vehicle, where it will reenact the methods of its murder upon the driver of the vehicle. 1337 will only appear for vehicles containing one person. It appears that Dilly's home video went with a mix of past and present for telling us the story of the hitchhiking girl. On the first run, she was perfectly normal, and on the second, she had no eyes. Either way, this is a ghost you would never want to run into, and it certainly isn't decommissioned after all. Mary knew what happened to her parents, and when the man responsible appeared, she knew exactly who he was. Those who understand the lessons of our last unbelievable story know the dangers of hitchhiking strangers, but isn't there another kind of responsibility we owe society when it comes to the elderly? Our older members of the community are often in need of our help, and we'd be looked down on quite severely if we ignored their situation. But in one particular instance of seeing an old gentleman in trouble, you may just wish to turn the other way. Happening just about anywhere you'll be unlucky enough to meet him, there have been stories told of an elderly man lurking about in isolated places. Sometimes an alley in the city, sometimes the deep woods, and even through sleepy neighborhoods just after sunset. Always bent over and lurching, signs of aging, the old man is covered in strange, hooded attire. The only visible parts of him, his wrinkled face and long, white beard. He appears in places and times that practically force those who see him to approach and ask if he's alright, knowing that his presence is very odd and even troubling. If his attention is called, he'll change his direction and head towards the one who's called out, not looking at them until finally stopping directly in front of them. Survivors of this encounter, few in number, then report the old man removing his hood, taking hold of his beard, and then tearing away his face, revealing the skull of mankind's oldest fear, the Grim Reaper, death himself. In an instant, he'll vanish, leaving the bewildered viewer to struggle over the reality of the sighting. Then, as they run from the spot, they encounter him again, now with his famous scythe in hand, ready to reap their soul. Another sad case, and another example of Dilly's blending the real article to present separate facts as one piece of the legend, SCP-1440, The Old Man From Nowhere, is almost right in its presentation here. 1440 is described as a man of unknown ethnicity and age, according to Foundation Archives. He travels alone and is constantly wandering, seeming to avoid civilization at all times, due to the nature of his anomalous effect. He is, by all appearances through his energy and touch, the Grim Reaper, and not even objects made by people escape his death-sentencing aura. Contact with creations and people result in their demise if the old man from nowhere stays around for too long. He and his belongings are the only exceptions to the rule of destruction. Single people, groups of humans, and entire cities and towns can be affected by his presence, and he is fully aware of this, choosing to avoid human life at all times. The only time he's ever made his way towards somebody on purpose is to seek his own demise, which is how the Foundation was made aware of him in the first place. He had come across a doctor on her way to work at a redacted site and asked for the Foundation's help, hoping they would be able to destroy him. He was brought into the site for questioning, which led to its ultimate destruction, killing everyone inside and destroying six SCP objects under containment. Attempts to reach the old man after this have only produced similar events. The fourth point of contact attempted was recorded due to precautions, and an interview took place that gives insight into SCP-1440's condition. One brave doctor made contact personally with a man to provide inquiry. Do you know why we brought you here, they asked. Of course I do, 1440 said, and I applaud you for still attempting to contain me, but since your last three attempts I came to realize you cannot help me. It would be best if you let me go, for your own good. The first brother is already standing behind you, Doctor. You would best hurry. You mentioned these brothers before. Three, if I recall correctly, the Doctor replied. Three, I. Different, but one and the same. All cruel, all vengeful, all capable of holding a grudge for a long time. They are the cause of my misfortune, and therefore the cause of yours. The second brother joins the first. Time is running short. Release me, or I cannot vouch for your safety. It might already be too late. I'm afraid I can't do that. Besides, you mentioned three brothers. If the third isn't here yet, we must have some time left. The third never appears. In that, he is crueler than both his brothers, for he knows his appearance is the only thing that will set me free. I have spent time untold searching for him, trying to return his prize and those I won from his brothers, but to no avail. The second has his hands on your shoulders. It is too late now. Doom is never far behind the second. Before you perish, my poor child, allow me to give you a word of advice. Should you choose to challenge death to a game of cards for your life, there is one thing you must never do. Win. 
Immediately after the final statement, the on-site nuclear weapon stored in the area detonated, defying multiple security systems that kept it from activation. The site was destroyed, and all personnel died. SCP-1440, however, was spotted more than 3,000 kilometers away one week later. He suffered no injuries. And if that wasn't enough to freak you out, we still have one more stop on our list according to Dilly's video. What could possibly be freakier than a real-life Grim Reaper walking around that can decimate a city just by coming near it? Nearly all of our legendary tales have had the appearance of something you wouldn't wish to come across, or would have had the sense to avoid entirely. But what does a person do when not even something that can normally be enjoyed is tainted by a menacing force? For this stop, we head to Ride Beach, New Hampshire. Here lay the remains of Rocky's Ridge, a theme park that's been long abandoned after closing in 1987. Rocky's Ridge always had financial issues that made keeping the park open a difficult task, but the tragedy of 1985 was the true mark of death for the park. In similar fashion to other larger amusement parks in the United States, Rocky's attempted to have an underground area for its mascots to change costumes and get around the park in secret. The tunnel system has been in operation for years with no major incidents involving employees. In late September of 1986, a gas leak in the tunnel turned deadly when a disobedient mascot broke the no smoking rule. The tunnel system ignited, killing several employees instantly and creating a cave in that trapped many other. Despite their attempts to honor the lives lost and reach settlements with families, Rocky's Ridge couldn't avoid the plague of public outcry and controversy that followed. They shut down officially in January of 1987 and salvaged what they could of the park, but didn't possess enough funds to take care of all of that remain. Over time, the state of New Hampshire assisted in removing the ruins and revitalizing the land into an official public park, but locals say the tragedy of Rocky's Ridge haunts the area to this day. Visitors who have broken into the fenced off area claim to have seen the remains of mascots haunting this location, exacting vengeance for their deaths by enforcing the no trespassing rule by force. Some believe they're spirits that can't move on, others insist they're zombies saying the mascots are those who survived the tunnel collapse and ate the bodies of fellow employees to survive. Now, they hunt trespassers, killing and cannibalizing them to continue their undead existence. Reports say there have been mutilated corpses of teenagers and college students found in the park, and some caretakers on official business have even shared a few words of warning about there being a presence still lurking in Rocky's Ridge. If only it was as simple as ghosts or zombies. SCP-3325, live entertainment, is a little bit more horrifying than both of those things. According to Foundation Records, the location in question is not an abandoned theme park, but it is a place that was created to entertain children. It's an abandoned television studio grounds with underground labs, living spaces, testing and containment areas, and a mass incinerator hidden away. Owned by Real Characters Industries, this was a site designed for the creation of biologically engineered children's entertainment mascots. Take the idea of Sesame Street, or Barney, or something like it, and imagine a mad scientist using real human beings, animal DNA, and bleeding-edge biotech to make living puppets for those shows. Always in character, always obedient, never having to be paid or take government-mandated breaks, and able to be mass-produced and potentially sold to companies who saw the value. Now imagine this kind of setup going horrifically wrong, because of course it did. Whether it was someone in a costume that was lobotomized and brainwashed to the point of only understanding their character as their personality, or a talking, walking fantasy creature that was never meant to exist, every level of these experiments failed in one way or another. Video logs recovered by the Foundation reveal the mascots had mental deterioration to the point of only understanding animalistic behavior, turning them into scared, angry abominations with a need to escape. Video 1 reveals a practice run for a show segment failing as the Big Bird ripoff jumps ahead on its lines and then begins biting human co-hosts. Video 2 shows evidence of two guards abusing some of the creatures in their holding cells, revealing that the hats the experiments were wearing as part of their costume were actual organic portions of their bodies. Discovered Media Artifact 3 is an audio log from one of the researchers stating, The applications for these subjects are endless. Children's television shows are just the tip of the iceberg. In 50 years, we may be seeing petting zoos, live performances, appearances at events. We may even succeed in creating subjects that are suitable to be kept as pets. The audio log details the researchers' efforts to improve the creatures, talking about how they've achieved speech by restructuring vocal cords, but intelligence is severely lacking. They need a neurologist or two to come on board. There's eventually a very serious issue of cell destabilization address after that record, and notes made of a character actually breaking down and melting on stage during a recorded performance. As time goes on, the researcher states deep concerns about the behavior of the latest batch of characters. They seem to be showing a previously unseen form of intelligence and displaying herd mentalities. 
Things really begin to unravel when there's a security breach stemming from a group of characters all playing dead, luring the guards into their cell to be attacked. The researcher begins sliding major security breaches on shocking scales as the creatures become far more hostile. The more they're stabilized and perfected, the more vicious they seem to become. At the end of the audio logs, the researcher describes men in suits who visit an area of the facility that nobody else is able to access or provided information about. This comes shortly before all the other researchers are rounded up by the characters during a mass security breach that released all the recent subjects. He says that the way it happened, it must have been planned. The researcher meets his end when unidentified men enter the room and shoot him four times, then confirm over a communication system that R36 has been terminated. The gunmen also state they need to evacuate immediately. The researcher contacted somebody just before he was found, so they need to get what they came for and get out. It's assumed that whoever was really running the show here escaped before the arrival of SCP Foundation personnel, who appeared quickly enough to capture evidence of what was happening under the TV studio facade, much of it in the form of all the creatures released from containment to execute the researchers and guards. Efforts are reported to still be ongoing for securing documents, creatures, and the locations of research facilities associated with the real characters industries. And that pretty much wraps up our dive into the leaks provided by Dillies. Let's see how they decided to end the Shalaki D Studio Trojan Horse and call it a night. Last but certainly not least on our list is our most shocking, true, and unbelievable story of all. Curiosity is man's inherent vice, and even though he's quite aware of that fact, it seems he just can't resist putting himself into danger. Wait, the, fields beyond the your slipcover house, on the tape said there are only eight like stories. There wasn't any mention of a ninth, and we've already gone over the advertised runtime. I'm not sure we should go forward with this, but I'm not getting any readings of anomalous activity from the recording room either. And it's not letting me pause the video anyway. Just nearby. Practically within sight of your window, and in the middle of the field, among the corn and pumpkins, there it stands. The Scarecrow. Okay, and rumors must have been right. We need to kill this off like right now. I'm cutting the feed. Give me a moment. Alright, that should have done it. I'm not feeling any anomalous effects from seeing what little of that we did. But then again, I'm not actually human myself, so it shouldn't have much of an impact on me. As long as you guys are okay, we're all good, right? Some SCP objects are harmless, others only work on you if you do a certain thing, others only operate on certain levels. We should be alright. Just, um, just tell me if anything starts to go not so great on your end, okay? I'm going to do a bit of digging and see if I can find out what this one was meant to be. We, um, we ought to be fine. I'm sure we'll be fine. Everything usually turns out okay with these things. That's all for now, everybody. I'd like to thank you for coming by to view this with me for a second journey into the SCP Foundation archives. Major appreciation goes to all of my supporters on Patreon who made this entire endeavor possible. Really, without Patreon, this version of the SCP Vault would never have been possible. It took a lot of effort, time, and resources to make this happen, and I appreciate you all so much for making it a reality. If you'd like to see even more Nightmine content given as much of a visual angle and punch as this, and a certain other upcoming October video or two, consider joining my Patreon. Even just $1 a month helps out tremendously and makes it possible to do things like this and everything else that's been created for this October. You might even get to see some behind the scenes content on the making of this material. Stick around to the end of this video to see the names of all the creatures of the night that are already supporting the channel. If you've enjoyed this edition of SCP Vault and Nightmine content in general, hit the like button and subscribe to see more. Don't forget to click that bell icon that YouTube forces me to talk about so that you actually get notifications for videos that upload. And consider dropping a comment down below telling me which SCP entry was your favorite. And of course, if you start seeing anything weird as a result of that last odd entry. Sharp-eyed viewers generally get a bit more of a kick out of everything I upload, whether it's my own doing or something I'm covering. That's all for tonight. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne. And like my need to leak extremely dangerous information to the public about monsters, murderers, and mystical mayhem, I'll be back again real soon. Sleep tight.